units that are mounted on, on our mowers currently. So we're tracking every piece of property that the park maintenance is mowing throughout Edina. The different colors are the different mowers. But anywhere you see clusters of blue dots or green dots, that shows that those are areas that are being mowed. We mow parkland, we mow uh, medians in the middle of streets, we mow entry ramps onto highways. Uh, it's, it, there's a lot of territory outside of parks that we're mowing currently. Uh, Lake Cornelia, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that there's uh, been some issues at Lake Cornelia. The sign on the right is a water advisory that we now uh, are going to post year-round because of some uh, issues with blue-green algae and how that can be harmful to humans uh, and dogs using the park. So Lake Cornelia has been listed on the Federal Impaired Waters List. Excess nutrients in the water contribute to algae blooms. Restored natural buffers reduce nutrient runoff. And a clean uh, buffer alone obviously would not solve all those issues. Uh, but a clean water strategy for Lake Cornelia will be developed under the Comprehensive Water Resources Management Plan of 2020. And that's part of the engineering department. So this slide, this slide shows the southwest quadrant of uh, the Lake Cornelia area. Uh, it's the area we're investigating right now. It's, you can see the property lines are uh, defined in the white border lines around each private property. And then everything north of that is uh, currently park property. So we're working with a, an engineering firm called Applied Ecological Services, AES. Uh, they came out and looked at the park parcel, which is uh, all the various colors on this map. Uh, they identified the different types of current vegetation throughout there. In general, most of it's either mowed turf or degraded quality natural areas. Uh, there is one unusual feature is that point separate uh, on the east side of the map with uh, private property separating the two parcels, but that is part of the proposed project area. This shows the uh, concept that Applied Ecology AES helped us uh, develop. Uh, we've, we took feedback at all these various input uh, methods through the website, through the open houses, and altered our plan while, while we were developing it. Uh, again, the different colors identify uh, different types of uh, plant materials throughout the parkland based on uh, soil conditions, hydrology, and and uh, trees. The black line down the middle of the parcel indicates a wood chip trail. So if you were going to walk from uh, east to west through the parcel, you'd have a defined trail to follow. There's also a straight line uh, from Laguna to the lake, so you'd get straight access to the lake if you were uh, coming off of Laguna. Uh, we're showing a bench on each end of it. So if you were walking this with your dog or just wanted to sit and stare at the lake, there's two different places. There's the little uh, red square on the east side and on the northwest side uh, at the ends of the trails that designate uh, benches that you could sit and observe the lake. So these slides show the existing and proposed conditions. On the left, uh, you can see we have mode turf right up to uh, some trees and buckthorn. This is right on the edge of Laguna, on the edge of the park. And then the proposed condition is a wood chip trail. You can see in the picture on the right. Uh, the bench seating area, the buckthorn has been removed. Uh, native trees are still in place. We're gonna remove any ash trees and buckthorn through this project, but other existing trees would stay in place. And again, you can see people would still be able to use the, the trail. There's native flowers and native grasses throughout this project. This is a location number two. So this is looking back to the east. And uh, the existing condition on the left shows mowed turf all the way to the water's edge, which is uh, one of the things we're trying to correct with this project. And then on the right, again, it shows native flowers, prairie grasses, 
and a trail that the community can still use to uh, enjoy this parcel, walk through the property. And uh, with this project, we would hire a consultant or a uh, installation team that would build out the uh, and plant out the uh, prairie area, and it would fall under a maintenance contract in the future. So we wouldn't allow buckthorn to come back. We wouldn't allow the invasive species. It would be maintained in a manner similar in that proposed condition. So what are the, some of the challenges to this area? So we're back to this first slide I showed you. Uh, challenges really throughout the park system. When we have uh, park land that meets up with residential land, uh, we face a lot of encroachment throughout really our whole system. People will uh, view the property as their backyard. Eventually, some people mow the back their our property and view it as their backyard. We've had instances where irrigation systems have been installed on our property. Uh, chemical applications happen on parkland by private individuals. We've had trees removed uh, without permissions. Uh, so that's some of the challenges we face at this site also. And then again, uh, uh, discussing that point, how it is broken up by a piece of private land, uh, maintaining that creates a challenge. And then the proximity to 6629, uh, clearly our property is very close to that home, which is an unusual situation. So funding uh, uh, for this program. Uh, engineering reached out to Nine Mile Creek Watershed District and uh, there's a cost share grant of $25,000 available for this project because Nine Mile Creek supports this concept. They would really like us to install this for water quality. Uh, we also have a shoreline natural, naturalization and natural areas maintenance projects that are included in the stormwater utility fund that are approved annually through the CIP. So there is money available through engineering for these types of projects throughout the city to naturalize areas that are mowed turf right up to water's edge. So there would be uh, no park funding for this and there would be no assessments to any homeowners with this project. So what are the benefits uh, with this buffer project? Uh, obviously reduced stormwater runoff would lead to, lead to cleaner water. Native plants support wildlife, including pollinators. Right now, pollinators are uh, in the news all the time uh, with the decline of the bee populations. This would create natural habitat for bees. Native landscapes support sustainability goals uh, requiring less mowing and fewer carbon emissions. And that would be either with, with park staff mowing it or with private residents mowing these areas. Uh, what are our next steps? Uh, next week, Tuesday, July 16th, we go to the City Council and ask for construction bid authorization. Uh, we also would ask to join the agreement for the $25,000 grant with Nine Mile Creek. And then we're also requesting a maintenance access easement so we can get uh, access to that parcel that we discussed, the point on the east side of this map so we could cross the private property to install the uh, native plant materials and maintain them in the future. And with that, I'm hoping to hear comments uh, from commissioners on um, what they think of this proposal. Okay, thanks, Tom. Corin, I know you had a question. I actually have several questions, but um, my first question was really, um, so I understand that we are, um, going to decrease some of the um, pollutions that are coming into there, but do we know what's causing that pollution it itself in terms of the bad water no one can go into? There is an extensive study on the engineering side, uh, and there, water runoff is one of many causes, and that's why in 20, I mentioned in 2020, they're going to uh, uh, explore, sorry, explore more of the uh, issues and come up with a plan to solve water quality at Lake Cornelia. On my side, on the park side, this helps contribute to cleaner water, but this won't Doesn't solve, solve clean water for Lake Cornelia. This one project is not enough yeah. to solve these issues. I agree. Um, the other thing, I, because you mentioned the runoff, and I also I heard you mention that 
several of these um, homeowners are um, mowing or putting sprinklers or removing trees. How are we holding those um, owners accountable to to how they're treating that as well as the implications of if they're using fertilizer for, per se that's damaging that? Is there an accountability that we have there? It's difficult right now. Uh, I would be interested in, we've, I've, I'm smiling at Perry, we've discussed creating a, an encroachment policy, which is not in place currently. So right now it's a case-by-case case situation, yeah. which makes it difficult for staff to enforce. I agree. And my other question is, from a holistic perspective, is do we know if the same situation is happening at, um, I believe it's Lake, Lake Edina, the other lake that's kind of in the same similar situation? As far as runoff? Like the water quality is, I mean, is that next step? Is, is, that, is that water quality there easily a second to this that we're going to have this? I, I'm not very familiar with that project. I know we are looking at buffers really throughout the city because yeah. we have a lot of mowed grass right up to water's edge. I just remember this is, that's one lake that I remember similar conversations as Lake Cornelia that we've said that it's kind of their backyard, but it's actually not their backyard, and sometimes they think it's ownership and that kind of stuff. So I, anytime you have that kind of situation, you're going to have issues where things can be rode into water, and I just was curious if that was, if today we're talking about Lake Cornelia and like a few weeks we see the next agenda, and it's like, oh, well, that, that's similar. I just was, it's always nice to have shared learnings if we're going to do something like that. Yeah, this, just, this project was is unique because engineering has a lot of the same goals as parks on this project, so that's why this came to the top first. The other thing, I, sorry, I'm just going to ask some of my questions, then I'll be done with you. Yeah. Um, I, I have them all listed here. So the other one is, I didn't, so right now there is a nature trail on the, um, kind of by the tennis um, paddleboard, paddleboard, or what, mm -hmm. courts, pickleball, thank you, thank you, pickleball courts, there's a nature trail. I can't figure out from the maps, does that connect to this? So it, it will not connect. Okay. So access across uh, 66th Street becomes a safety issue right there. Yep. And we already have a safe crossing uh, at the next street over. So having two crossings right in the same spot. So we're really proposing a loop where you could go out and yeah. come back. And the road, the path that's shown going up to 66 is really maintenance access. Okay. So then we would have to have a new signage created, right? Probably. I'm just thinking, and my next part of that is is forward thinking is, are we going to call it something different? So we have one that's called the nature trail and it's signed already there. If it's a mm -hmm. different trail, it's like, make sure that we have some form of signage that has a different naming convention. So it's like, Hey, I'll meet you at the nature trail. And by the way, I'm on the one side and you're on the other side that we can make sure just cause that's part of our, our overbear, our bigger plan is making sure the signage and the wayfinding exists. So I just want to understand what, is there a different name that we're going to use for that as well? So just curious. Yeah, and that. currently the trail, that grassy area, goes all the way to 66 people are safely crossing it right yeah. now but we don't want to propose an improved crossing without making it safer so okay so you're saying that we are going to try to have a connect like with a crosswalk or are you saying we're going to have it completely separated Com completely okay. separate okay thank you another question trick uh tom you said that you attended uh, in your staff report on page two the group annual meeting. Do you recall how many people were there, roughly? Um, mm. I didn't do a head count. It was busy. Okay. It was upstairs at. Yeah, you uh, said there were 20, 25. Okay, because you attended, 25 people attended the open house. So that was a good representation of the neighborhood, you think? That of the lake owner, uh, yeah. the 25 at the open house at, mm -hmm. at Roslyn? Uh, that was a good representation of the area. The Lake uh, Homeowners Association was obviously a group of very active people at Lake Korea, so right on the lake, they gave me direct feedback. Okay. You know what percentage-wise uh, of this, the, the group that you're trying to communicate with? Like 25 uh, people, does that represent 1%? A hundred percent? Any idea? I, I don't have an idea on that, but the people that have concerns along the lakeshore uh, were the majority of the people that showed up. So of those 25, a lot of them uh, were for it for water quality or against it because it uh, impacts their property. Okay. Is this the only section that we're talking about? Because that's water on the south side of the street, water on the north side of the street. Is 
this southwest section the only section we're talking about? Correct. So the north side is all parkland and it's pretty much uh, cattails and buffered out. There's no opportunity. And the east side is all private property right up to the water's edge. So we have no opportunity to impact that area. Okay. And then the, the private property piece that sticks in there. I almost got the impression you, you said maybe they were cooperating or it's, it's well, being taken care of. Or what's actually So uh, on the point, are you asking about the, yeah. the east side? 67, 16. 16. So that, yeah, so the, uh, they're in favor of uh, moving forward with this project, but legally we'd have to get uh, an agreement to allow maintenance workers to cross their property in order to plant it and cross it in, the, in order to maintain it. And the, uh, that agreement has not been signed yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there'd be no path through their property to get there'd out to no the point. There'd be no public access. Correct? No public access. Okay. By land. Yep. To that area. And on their property, would there also be a buffer or no? I, I wasn't sure on that. You just skip their property or? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know for certain if their goal is the same as ours. They're, what they're interested in water quality, and I'm speaking on their behalf, and he's sitting behind me. Uh, uh, but we're not engaging with them, saying that you have to do this. So it'd be voluntary. And there are uh, other people on the lake that voluntarily are buffering already on okay. private property. Okay. So we're trying to lead by example. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask a Yeah, go ahead, question? Brenda. Okay. Uh, so I know you mentioned that some of the um, residents that are right up to the lake had some concerns over it, but you, you have reached out to everybody that has property and have they given them an opportunity to talk about what it is, and do you think most of that's been resolved then at this point on what they were concerned it's about? It's difficult to resolve because we're proposing to buffer right up to the property's edge. Mm -hmm. But we have heard from, I would guess, the majority of them through email, uh, the Better Together website or the Open House and the uh, Lake Homeowners Association also. So we have got a lot of feedback from them, but the difficulty is uh, the proximity. We're proposing the buffer ha goes right to the property as opposed to a transition zone. And does it need to go right to their property for it to, for us to get the advantages of it or? So the, the goal is Again, not just water quality. If it was only water quality, uh, there, there could be an argument to uh, determine a number of feet from the water's edge. But our goal is also just uh, naturalization of underutilized parkland. So converting mowed turf to natural prairie area, which is that whole section, not just the area along the lake. Okay, and then on the trail, what is their feeling about the trail? Because I'm assuming right now they probably don't have that many people walking in front of their homes with the lake there, but so it could be wrong. But our, One of our early renditions showed it actually following right on the transition of all the properties on the west side. Uh, they clearly didn't want that. They wanted it staged away from their mowed turf mm -hmm. to the center. Uh, so we moved it away from the property. We did have feedback from a couple of people at the open house that they weren't aware that it was park property. Mm. So they were asking that we sign it as a park trail. So as if you're walking past on Laguna, you would know that you're actually welcome to walk on that path as a <coughs> resident and use the park. Okay. Uh, and then my other point is um, a little bit different than Corin's signage point, but I'm worried, you know, if people start using that trail, I'm just thinking about like Lake Harriet or the Calhoun where the dogs start to go in the lake. And if we have such a quality issue, I just want to make sure the signage was good. And we have so two. So thought, hey, I can. This is a great opportunity yeah. for me to start. So the two with signs. My we have three of those signs installed already, mm -hmm. and two of them are on this uh, property already. One at Laguna on the east side, and one at the northwest corner. So what we we view as the two main access points for that area. We have the uh, the warning sign, which again came from engineering, uh, because it's a uh, annual water quality issue. Mm -hmm. So rather than finding out if there's a problem and then posting it, we're just going to post it all the time, year round, just to make yeah, people Yeah, I think aware. that's a great idea. And so mm -hmm. just if you could look at it as a, 
development continues. I just want to make sure we don't have any issues with somebody thinking now we've developed something on the side and you can go in the water because um, usually you hear it on the news at some point during the summer. Mm-hmm. No longer, you know, go in the water. But I just want to make sure there aren't any people that get sick or dogs that would get sick. Um, and then my other, and I think this is my last question, is this the right order to do it in? So, for instance, you said that the water, um, what, what group is it? The engineering department will be having this on their 2020 plan. So does it make sense that we do the buffer first? I really don't know. Or do you wait to see what that plan looks like and ensure that this meets whatever their criteria is for the improvement of the So I haven't been involved on that side of the project, but I understand they already have identified multiple things that could help this area. Uh, this project isn't, isn't designed to solve clean water at Lake Cornelia. It will help. It's a step in the right direction. That's why we're proposing it. It happens to fit uh, parks goals and engineering goals and Nine Mile Creek goals. So that's why this came to the top is the first Yeah, priority. I really like it. And it's, a, but and it's I, um, relatively affordable. Sometimes I feel like we do some things out of order. I just wanted to make sure that that was considered. Like we, we put something in, but then we don't really have the plan yet. And just want to make sure it's all coordinated and this would actually fit in with what they were doing and that. And this would have fit outside of water quality at Lake Cornelia. This would have fit other plans that we're working on citywide. So we're, it, it, this isn't focused just on Lake Cornelia. We're looking at underutilized areas throughout the city to convert to natural buffer areas, mm -hmm. especially along waterways. Okay, good. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of my stuff is similar to some of the stuff that you heard. I think I'm grouping it mostly into residents residents and the property that they purchased, and then there's the maintenance piece of it, um, and then there's the access piece of it to me. So, you know, I've talked to a couple of the residents there. I happen to know them, and you know, when they purchased their property, they purchased a lake view property, right? And I think some of them are disgruntled or, uh, you know, aren't exactly happy because they were, when they bought that, they knew that the park system was going to take care of that. Now you're proposing something that's going to take care of that. What can we do to ensure that that maintenance can, will continue for a period of time? And then also in the maintenance is if we put a wood chip trail in, how often do we have to replace it? You know, what are we going to do to monitor the growth? I mean, Member Miller has commented a couple of times about Braemar and that growth, and it's not necessarily what we, and I would say the same as him, it's not what I expected. And so if we're planning to do this, how do we ensure that that growth comes to what we expect to have happen? Um, so those are a couple of things, both kind of residential and maintenance. The access piece to me, if it's just the access to Laguna from the Laguna place, and it kind of just goes to one end and then you have to kind of walk back, you know, we, when we talked about Fred Richards, one of the things that the residents around the Fred Richards Park talked about was traffic and the, the car traffic that could potentially impact them. This is going to add foot traffic, and if we're not monitoring it, you're going to see probably bike traffic on those on this prop, on these things. And then you also have in there a picnic table where people can congregate at, at the, I guess, the north end of the trail. Um, you know, what are we doing to monitor those things and to, you know, I mean, because I... I preface all this by saying I, I'm, I, I like the project. I understand the reason for the project. I just also understand that there's, I think, 11 properties that of residents that are there, which is a small percentage. I know it's a start in the right direction, but it's a small percentage of probably the actual any pollution that's happening in that lake. It's just a small percentage from those 11 properties. Um, I just want to, based off of other things we've seen over the course of the last couple of years, is how much impact or how much influence can the residents have in some of these things and especially when you look at that one property where literally the property line i think goes to their deck so i guess those are a bunch of comments and questions and yeah so that uh to qualify for the grant it uh we are forced to maintain it uh to the standards of the grant for 10 years so it for sure will be under a maintenance contract for 10 years with a private contractor that specializes in native prairies uh, so I'm not uh, very concerned about the maintenance of it going forward. Uh, you know, removing buckthorn and doing those kinds of things require uh, immediate attention, every or annual attention. So that'll be part of the contract to make sure those items don't grow back. The uh, design itself, uh, the goal is to have similar to the proposed uh, picture on the side, lower growth, so you can see. Uh, 
you'd still have lake views. Most of the houses on the uh, west side are elevated. So if it's two to three feet tall, I don't think it'll affect lake views. Sure. We're not proposing planting new trees. We're removing some ash trees, removing buckthorn. And those were all intentional to uh, not hinder the current view that people have to the uh, lake. So we listened to that comment quite a bit. Uh, again, the maintenance will be an ongoing uh, uh, CIP item that is agreed to annually ahead of time. So the maintenance of that will be a private contractor. I'm not concerned about the maintenance keeping up on it. And the design is, we're showing it as more flowers and more showy than the golf design is currently. So the goal is to, because it's such a prominent uh, feature right in everyone's backyard is to keep, keep it more showy, more flowers. And the, the safety aspect or the or visitors coming to the trail, uh, I view it as neighborhood use that's currently in place. So we put the wood chip trail there to allow people that are currently using it to continue to use it walking dogs. I don't see it as uh, creating traffic problems because I don't view it as a destination necessarily. It's more people are out in the neighborhood walking and they'll be able to walk on the trail. Other questions? Uh, Julie. Oh. Just last one, sorry. Is there any place locally that's done this before, kind of similarly, that maybe we can use as a comparison point for success or learnings that maybe they had to change on the fly while they were doing it, just, just out of curiosity? I can. I don't have a list right now that I could generate, but I could. I could come up with success stories. Okay. Cool. Julie. So, my question relates to the state requirement um, for buffers around waterways, and I think it's mostly outside of the metro area, but it's a hot topic in Greater Minnesota, where <coughs> unlike this situation where we're talking about using public land and creating a buffer on public land, um, there's a state requirement that a lot of private property owners are creating. 50 foot buffers on their own private land to help protect the waterway. So I, I guess I would say, I mean, this is a, not just Edina um, focusing on this being one way to improve water quality, but it's been acknowledged by the state. Um, so, but in this case, we're only talking about the public land. Um, but do you know how the state buffer law applies at all in the Metro? I don't, but typically if we, if we do a, a roadway project, mm -hmm. a park improvement project, a lot of times it'll trigger a wetland permit. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, normally we'll trigger buffers similar to this. We've, we've had to do this really throughout the system over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, there were buffers around golf course holes back when the arena redid their parking lot. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, typically a 50-foot buffer, and I don't have those memorized. Uh, uh, average 50-foot buffer is usually what they're after throughout any it, waterways downstream from improvements. Yeah. I know it's one of the tools they're using to um, repair the health of impaired waterways in particular. Um, but then the other question, you mentioned the crosswalk. And um, the map that you had of the proposed project had a crosswalk um, in, well, maybe not this one. But where, I guess, where is the current crosswalk? And if it's not safe to cross where the access point is now. I so guess the I'm next just road, uh, the, I'm sorry, the road on the west has a crosswalk. I saw in my materials that there, it looked like it was just off the map, but I, my, mm. I guess my concern is that um, I, I would suggest um, looking at the fact that people just might cross where they shouldn't cross. Um, and if we're creating a trail on one side of the road, um, our people going to be crossing in an unsafe manner um, mm -hmm. because it is the fastest way between two points. And so I think that's something to think about um, if you're building a feature on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're looking. Yeah. This, is it the yeah, um, West Shore Drive? Yeah, West Shore. Oh, so that's not very far away. So that's the crosswalk you're expecting people to use. And we, and traffic mm -hmm. safety is... Uh, told me that they don't want to have two crossings close together because that yeah. creates an unsafe situation. But, but that is, I thought for some reason it was a little further down. That's close. That's a reason people might actually go use that one. Mm -hmm. It's not a block down. So is there a is there a sidewalk that goes from that crosswalk to? Or are we going to get into that area? Do you just on the north side there is not. 
walks. That, that I mean, so if that, if that, if I was 6601, I would be thinking, oh my gosh, are people going to be starting to walk a trail like walking in my yard? Because the crosswalk is here, and I get why public safety says that, but I would, if I'm going to, if I want to walk on the trail and I don't live there, I don't know how I get onto it um, without becoming best friends with 6601. Is that a true statement? Currently, there is not a sidewalk on that side. But I don't, I'm not envisioging much of a difference in usage than we currently have. So okay. we're not altering conditions and bringing in more people. People are already walking through this grassy area. And that goes, that this goes back, if I, I didn't mean car traffic, I meant foot traffic, bike traffic. I understand that this is supposed to be a local for these, you know, 30 homes that are in this picture, you know, to walk down and walk along the lake. And I, I, that makes all the sense in the world to me. But to Corin's point, if people are going to try and access that, they're, you're, you're thinking that people that maybe are living on the north side of 66, that they're going to walk all the way down West Shore Drive, all the way down Laguna and access there, and then walk the path back to where they came from and then turn around and come back. I just think that there's going to be naturally an access is going to be created either through the maintenance road or just people doing that. And I would hate for that to encroach on 6601 mm -hmm. as people maybe just kind of access jump off their driveway there. And mm -hmm. so I think we, we need to make sure that we have a conversation or a signage or whatever that needs to be with that, those, those folks as well, just because I think, I think people will find that this is relaxing and nice and it's a nice little area. And obviously it's one of the, it's, great that there's a lake that's in the middle of Edina that people can use. I just think that we have to assume that it's not going to just be for the people that live in the South Lake Cornelia neighborhood that are going to use that access, that, that path. Yeah. I, yeah, I just think, I, I mean, I meant to say what I said before, but even if it's a small cross, a small sidewalk there, cause even West shore drive doesn't have a, so, a sidewalk. So, I mean, I think that if anybody wants to figure out where to come through, there's just, I think from a safety perspective, even if it's someone who lives there today and it's like someone 12 and under, West Shore is busy enough, and so is 66, that I th think that we should at least have some form of consideration around, even if a minor sidewalk at the top, or I don't, you know, I don't know what their answer is, but I think from a safety perspective, it's, that's my only biggest, that's my biggest concern on, on that. Okay. But if we, there's an we can existing trail now. But there's not an existing trail, it's just a, it's just a backyard it doesn't exist as a pack as a as, as right. There? So right now it's mowed turf. People are currently walking dogs. I'm assuming the traffic patterns can be similar than what it is currently it is. Is it mowed shorter in that certain trail than the rest of the yards? Uh, there currently is a maintenance trail right now. Okay. That's how we access the property. Okay. If if 6601 doesn't feel like they're going to have people in their backyard, then I think that's okay. Well, I, I just want to make sure. I think what you're hearing, it's a, it's a good safety call out that we're going to have to watch that. That's right? the kind of comments. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that access on the northwest side could become an issue. Uh, there may be a consideration that it's a trail today, but when you put a wood chip path in there, it now becomes a trail and people start to talk about it, right? So. Yeah. And I would argue that, to your point, people, I don't think, realize that that is public property. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you, that's likely that no one outside the homes that are abutting the property are using it because no one knows that it's they're just not just walking in someone's yeah. yard. Um, but if you put a trail in and have signage on it in any way, um, the, it is gonna, probably not going to get a lot more use because it's not, um, it is a short trail along the lake and there's a larger paved trail just on the other side of the road, but it will get some use and people are going to expect to be able to get to it, not through someone's yard. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I won't echo everything that you've heard here, but I think just to summarize at least what I've heard in my perspective, love the environmental aspect of it. I think that's a good first step. Uh, like the use of green space, right? We've got, we say we've got 1,550 acres of parks and green space, and so as we can utilize it more, I think that's a good thing. But I would encourage us to be, continue to be proactively engaged with the neighbors in that area. Mm -hmm. Right. We have to, as you would say, bend over backwards to make sure that we keep them engaged because I do think that northwest access could become an issue. You know, I, there are obviously some issues here that whether it's they didn't know it was public property or they already encroached on pro public property, you're already aware of what those issues would be. So um, I like 
uh, Corin's point as well about thinking about whether it's Lake Edina or anywhere else in Edina that we should be thinking about something similar. How do we leverage what we're doing and learning here to, to apply that there? And I know you, you identified the funding sources, but do you have a sense of what the overall cost of this will be when it's done next July? So we haven't done an estimate on this project yet. Uh, the grant, the matching grant of 25000 if uh, if the city matches that, it would be 50000 But until we go to bid, uh, right, and we haven't finalized the exact plant structure yet, uh, we won't know. Okay. And then the last thing I'd note is, and it's just a small concern, but representing from a park perspective, I know, at least as I read the documentation, I think... You got, we, we got city council approval back in March to start this. Clearly you've shown us you've had some other meetings, inputs, open houses, and yet from a park perspective, I think this is the first time we've heard about it. And I actually learned about it yesterday in the About Town magazine. And so I'm kind of thinking, oh, I'm reading about this in a publication before we've heard anything about from a park perspective. So again, I might just encourage us as a department to think about how we can bring this to us a little bit earlier in the process. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that feedback. Yep. Okay, great, Tom. Thank you for the update, and good luck as you move forward with it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, next up, uh, Perry, I believe you've got an Arden Park. Oh, no, Tom's got the Arden Park. He's got the mic. He's got the Arden Park update. All right, this, this is going to be a lot simpler. <laughs> So uh, today I was just going to give you a quick Arden Park Improvements Progress uh, update. I understand you've had a few of these along the way, but the other day uh, during one of the construction meetings, uh, I took a few pictures. So I thought uh, you'd be interested in seeing the progress uh, where we at uh, as of last week. So here's the foundation being built for the uh, storm or the uh, warming house. Shelter is the word I'm looking for. Uh, you can see the foundation is installed. Uh, they're digging in utilities. Uh, the base is all built up, so this process has started. They hope to uh, pour the concrete slab uh, this week and start framing walls, some of the wall materials on site. Already, if you drive by, you can see the stacks of materials. Uh, the weather has been challenging, but everybody is making progress. So this is the north bridge being installed. So we never had a loop of trail on the north end of the park. I'm, I'm hoping you guys are pretty familiar with the design. Uh, but this would be the north trail, the north bridge. And across uh, from the bridge, you can see the uh, boardwalk section that leads to some stairs that goes up the hill on the west side of the park, the northwest side of the park. So now you'll have access as a full loop. Uh, the deck boards are down, they're just installing the railing. That should all be wrapped up and installed. They're starting on all the trails really throughout the park now, so you can really see everything coming together. And this is the south bridge. So we always had a bridge between the warming house and the ice rink in this location and the main trail that comes through the park. This is just an updated version and a slightly new location of that. Uh, these guys are installing the uh, electrical conduit to supply the uh, building infrastructure so they can get going on that. And behind you can see where the ice rink, the hockey rink used to be. We removed all the boards. Those are going back in in the fall. We, we rebuild one rink uh, every year throughout the park system. So we chose to open this park with a brand new board system around the uh, uh, hockey rink. So in general, uh, progress is happening. The rain is... Uh, not helpful, but they're, they're chugging along. They're making good progress. They're going to start uh, the planting along the creek soon, really starting from the south end towards the north end as they can shape those materials out and do final grading. The trails are uh, being shaped out and uh, taking shape right now. The, st the stormwater basins along the road you can see uh, taking shape, so they're making progress despite all the poor weather. And that's all I have for pictures. So the stormwater basins are not yet functional? Correct. Right. It's too bad, it'd be a perfect test. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments or questions on Arden Park? 
the, the only comment I had is I know we've been we're tempted to continue to be proactive about saying safety issues don't come through the park, et cetera. But I also noticed that uh, Mayor Hubland has a walk with the mayor in October going through the park. So I'm assuming we feel comfortable it'll be in good shape by then to have residents following him through the park. Yeah, so the establishment of the grass and some of those features won't uh, be complete at that time, but we're expecting the trails to be complete. Okay. Uh, so we should be able to walk over the new bridge, walk the trails, see the sites. Okay, good. Good. I was just going to comment. I think it looks really great, and I was just curious if you guys are getting any positive feedback from all the people who are against this and really negative vocally before. If we're getting some some good, like okay, it's better than I thought it'd be feedback. Just curious. I've been getting more positive good. Uh, feedback. Good. The the creek itself is interesting. You can see it from the road with the buckthorn removed. There's sight lines you never had at that park before. Uh, I don't think we'll win everyone over, but. It's an exciting project. Good. Thank you. Good. Anything else? Great. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Next up, uh, Fred Richards Park Playground Project. And Chair and Commissioner, I'll just give a, a quick update on that. Uh, these, um, the Phase 1 items were recently bid out. So the, the Phase 1 included on the east end building out a playground, playground container, some walkways, seating areas, and a... Um, small um, open air picnic shelter for that area and just want to let the commission know so next Tuesday all the bids will go to the City Council staffs recommending approval of all of them so we actually um, got some excellent bid bid results that came in so we'll be able to do everything and the alternates within that project budget so the establishment for phase one was I think three hundred thousand dollars so that'll include all the site improvements then the playground equipment and the picnic shelter for that price so um, that'll have a little bit of a longer lead time to get ordered, so we want to get going. Uh, July is the only council meeting, so we're going to hit that. Uh, we don't want to miss that and wait until August. Uh, the shelter itself, things have like a 10-week lead time at this point, so no one's carrying inventory. Everything's being built as you order. So our hope is that we can open up, hopefully yet this fall, to get a little bit of use before it, the seasons change. I won't say the W word, but... Um, since we're in July right now, we're, we're planning out that aspect. So um, hopefully those, uh, those are all approved next Tuesday and then we can keep moving forward on that phase one project. Good. Any questions? No? Nope. Thanks, Perry. Okay, next item uh, is to have a rundown of our work plan. Uh, and we'll just go initiative by initiative and see what kind of updates that we've got. Initiative number one, renaming public public facility in honor of the Yancey family. Matt, do you have anything new on that? No, uh, I reached out to uh, the member, one of the, uh, Jim is the, Jim Nelson, so I remember uh, member Nelson of the, um, uh, Human Rights and Relations Commission, and he was going to take what we had learned at the City Council meeting slash last Parks Commission meeting, and they were going to think about what would be a, a, a representative recommendation from their perspective, um, and then bring it back to us, and we were going to work together based off of that. I felt uh, in the conversation that we had that they needed to be probably taking the lead on what was an appropriate recommendation for the ANSI family. Um, and so they agreed and they were going to discuss that at the last meeting. And I have not heard back from them, but once we have that, then we'll be kind of putting together our formal proposal and be able to have it ready for city council. Okay, good. Thank you. Initiative number two, identifying participation barriers, possible participation barriers for communities of color. Brenda or Julie, either of you have an update on that? Yeah, we, um, finally have a connection with the Human Rights Relations Council um, and a list of folks who are interested in participating. We tried to set up a meeting before the 4th of July break and uh, did not get full participation and feedback for when the meeting can be. I'm waiting on one person now. Hopefully we'll have a meeting set next week. Um, I think uh, I've got, everyone has responded that they have gotten my email. <laughs> um, one more person is checking their calendar, but um, hopefully we'll have something on the calendar for next week. And I'm hoping it's the day that works for you as well. So. Yeah, Julie's doing a really nice job trying to herd everybody together yeah. and at least set up a meeting. Yeah, so. yeah I, I think they were listed as the lead, mm -hmm. um, but I said that we would do the legwork on getting folks together um, in hopes that that starts this project moving along. Good. Yeah, I think as we noted last month and in our discussion with City Council, love the idea of the cross commissions. It does tend to be somewhat more challenging to 
connect and maybe get started, but hopefully it'll be a, a, a much stronger project when we're done. Initiative number four, speaking of another cross, yep. or three, another cross uh, commission one, draft plan for Edina Grand Rounds. Corin. So I would basically mm -hmm. echo very similar to what Julie is. I'm st I was struggling to get people to respond, even that they even read the email, mm -hmm. first of all, um, to get to get a date. So um, I kind of gave the 4th of July a break because I didn't even, you're ambitious for that one. Um, I didn't even try, I didn't even shoot for that one. Yeah. So we're going to, I'm going to try to send out another voting buttons and to get um, the individual from the transportation and then our group to get together to start to have a meeting, to have a conversation. So it's still in a TBD, but I would update um, on here, Janet, that we do have a transportation person um, identified. So we're not waiting back to here. We're just waiting back to get a meeting started. So. Okay. Yeah, we've got a tag from the yeah. commission. So. So I wouldn't say it's on them. Yet. Okay. Good. Thanks, Corin. Uh, initiative number four is our utilization study of fields, rinks, and courts. I can give an update on that. Just uh, three quick points. We had started that last year, so this is a continuation. We had gathered some data at that point, so we've now updated some of that data on our field and rink use. Uh, we are still working to access court information, but I did get an email from Val, who is remaining our contact in the uh, public school system and she's got a request in for us to get that uh, court information as well. So we're hoping we'll have that by early next week. So that still is at a very high level, but at a high level that data reveals very heavy scheduled utilization of our assets. And I think our intent now is to consider how well are we integrating new sports into the field and court and rink use where there is are there new or underutilized assets that we could be uh, bringing into the fold and considering uh, is there an opportunity to partner we had that kind of in our comp plan how can we partner across other communities or even commercial space uh, and then how how might we improve on our current system to utilize space we we have a bit of a challenge in that we have two owners we have the city owning some of the assets and we have the school system owning some of the assets. Uh, and so we have uh, two owners that are doing our best to work together, but there can certainly be some cracks and some gaps in that. So that's kind of the intent of where we're headed once we get another updated, fresh look at the data. I'm going to give you my, this is my question for my concerns later, but I think it kind of it puddles into this group here. The question is comes down to um, who actually owns and is monitoring the um, the use of the fields in terms of who has a permit um, versus who doesn't. So, for example, if um, if he has his own soccer league and he wants to put together and, and play and wants to play on the fields whenever ESC and ESA and every other organization is playing but doesn't have a permit, how are we holding them accountable to making sure that we're using a permit? Um, and then there's been some um, some damage happening to some property. And the feedback I've been hearing, particularly from the soccer association and the soccer club, is that um, they have no way of holding them accountable because the city owns it. But when we call the city, they say call the police. And that doesn't feel like the right thing to have the police come say, do you guys have your permit to be using it? And there's some vi some um, some violations happening to like soccer nets and et cetera. So it's not so much a part of your um, initiative, but I think it's kind of goes back into here of, yes, there's an the ownership of the city and yes, there's the ownership of the schools, but is there ownership of the clubs? Is it, how does that all work together? Um, so I don't know how we want to put that in there together, but it's been brought to my attention on um, multiple occasions. Yeah. So. And when you say permit, are you thinking permit to exist as a team? No, or are you thinking of the that you have scheduled <laughs> to use the field? What I'm under, if you go to, say, Lewis Field, it says, like, you have to have a permit to play on these fields, like an organized sport, not just play. Just if you were to have an actual tournament or a game, it needs to be, you have to have an actual permit through the city. And no one's holding, no one's going back to say who has a permit and who doesn't have a permit. So okay. if, say, St. Louis Park wants to have a tournament or a game on our fields, no one's holding them accountable to that because there's a lot of damage that happens when a lot of heavy people are on fields that we aren't expecting. Okay. Does that make sense? It, it does. I, I think there's another, maybe not the same issue you're thinking of, but the other issue that was identified was fields may get scheduled, but then does anyone hold them accountable to whether they're actually used or not, or they just schedule it, right? Yep. We might use it, so let's schedule it. And then people drive past and say, well, no one's using the fields. But and that may be, that may may be a little different issue. That may so. be happening. I'm not aware of yep. that part. I'm just aware that there are people 
scheduling things without scheduling through the city. Okay. Um, so. All right. We'll at least kind of take that as a tangential item that we can learn more on. Okay, initiative number five, develop alternative funding options. Mike or Rick? So we, uh, so just to frame this for everybody's uh, reference, uh, we are perceiving that there's a shortfall in the funding that we can use to do all the wonderful things that we want to do for our parks. Um, that can be filled one and or two ways. One would be just outside philanthropic, philanthropic uh, organization like Friends of the Park. Uh, and we're not focused on that quite now. The other part is internally leveraging the assets that we have to create more revenue that we can invest back into our parks. That part is what we're looking at now. Uh, in the uh, a couple weeks ago, we met with a group, an outside group that does this type of things for organizations, cities, parks, leagues, uh, events. Uh, they do this all around the country to get an idea uh, of what the heck we're talking about and what we need to do. And they're very helpful. Um, and... Uh, Basically, what it came down to is uh, our next step is we don't know what our assets are. We don't know what they're worth. We don't know if we're leveraging them correctly. We're not. And we have to get that defined. And we're probably not going to be able to do that. You know, just us as a, as a group running around. So we'll probably need some kind of professional help in that area. Uh, and... When we get that understood, then that'll determine what our next steps are as far as any kind of internal leveraging. You know, do we have more opportunities, or are we doing a great job now? Where's the money all going? Um, you know, there's a lot of people involved in a lot of associations and a lot of leagues, and we don't know everything that's going on. So we got to get that defined, and. Um, so we're talking to uh, outside firm, and then we also, uh, Eileen, met with uh, Scott to discuss the same thing and to understand what would be the process uh, and what are the regulations and rules behind that also. So that's what's happened in the last month, and so our next step, so we'll be engaging with the city and Scott and Perry and trying to get that defined what yep. it is that we actually have and just to build off of that and this may be something you're already going to be working on but you know we bring in consultants to help us think about master park plans maybe there's a consultant maybe we can get some funding to have a consultant that comes in and says yes we've got expertise about that we can help you better define it right i, I think we'll have to because i just don't think that anybody here has any idea you're just throwing something at a dartboard and saying that looks good yeah okay yeah. thank you mike Initiative number six, review city created race and equity policy. Brenda or Julie, anything on that? Uh, yeah, we're, we're just waiting for the um, staff to provide that to us. So that they need to create that. And I think at the last meeting that was starting or, or was going to be in process soon. Is that right? That is correct. And actually, um, I had invited um, Heidi Lee, is the city's race and equity coordinator, and she also works with the Human Rights Commission uh, to attend the August meeting. So she would be able to kind of give you uh, the, the history on how that was created and share the policy and the thinking behind it, rather than once you do meet with um, any other cross-commission work to have that be, well, we believe it started this way, and just to get it right from Heidi and kind of go over that policy right from city staff to, to get that together. So Good. Thank you. And initiative number seven, work plan to receive AARP city designation. Yeah, so that point. one we met um, a couple of months ago, and we were supposed to do our walkabout uh, sometime in July. And so I sent a note out, um, and I don't think we've heard back, to the person who had organized that, um, I think on the health commission, to find out when we needed to be ready for that. And I also know some people had 
indicated that they would be willing to help us if we needed to do that walk around. So I, I, don't, I don't have any update yet, but it should be coming soon from what Corin and I know. Okay. All right, good. Thank you for that. All right, next up, chair and member comments. Commissioners, any comments from commissioners this month? You know, I did, I did see this last page um, on the correspondence, and I thought that was a good feedback and interesting. I don't know um, what funding or action there is, but it does make sense that there would be a watering spigot of some sort for if we have a truly have a dog park. And um, it's also softball courts there. But I the mean, Van Valkenburg dog yeah, park you're talking about. Yeah, but the yep. last page in here in the correspondence, yes. I, I think that's a good point that there is a dog park that is, has no way to water that dog. And um, assuming that it's actually going to be warm here on lots of days, I think that's a fair ask. I don't know what the next steps would be on that, but um, I don't know that needs to be an agenda item, but I just think it was a good point, and I... And it's not, thing. you know, I've been up at that field quite a bit, and I did swing by after the correspondence, just take a look, and it truly can't be more than maybe 150 yards or so from where the the shelter building is yeah. to that at least the top part of the small dog yeah. walk of it. We've got a long ways down to where the larger dogs are, but some at least maybe it's closer. a possibility to at least consider. You do have a, a roadway you have to manage one way or the other to get under or over or mm -hmm. around somehow, but I mean at the very least give them a hose. <laughs> I mean <laughs> I mean the fact they're bringing down the water is just... you got the hill there. Viaducts could work yeah, if you yeah. went from the maybe yeah. a, 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 rain, a rain barrel yeah. maybe. <laughs> so uh, Chair, actually, uh, Assistant Director Swenson and I were there this morning um, for another matter, just kind of looking at the site, and we did kind of discuss it as well. Um, currently, there isn't any funding to do that. It would yep. be um, something we'd have to plan for from an infrastructure standpoint. But also, I think we looked at the dog park area itself, and maybe that could use a little bit of, um, I don't want to strongly use the word master planning, but some sort of review of what we've got going on there. It just seems like it's kind of just continually evolved, and it's just started there there's not a lot of um maybe planning went into what should go there and how it should function and things like that so um that is something we could kind of maybe take a look back in the future i trust initiative number five will come up some with some creative alternative funding for us and we'll have our water at the yes. dog run <laughs> uh anybody else uh, the only other, I had a couple quick ones. Um, I know we've talked a, a bit about having uh, pickleball courts on our agenda, and I do think that's one we've got to have on an upcoming agenda. Um, I get, uh, my wife and I do play quite a bit, and we get comments around, boy, should we be considering guidelines for use with our current courts, because they are heavily utilized, and when are we going to have plans for future courts? So maybe to generate some concepts and ideas around how we can continue to meet that. Um, Braemar Master Park prioritized initiatives continue to come up as well. We approved those over a year ago, and I believe they're also parked at the moment because we are doing some very good initiatives and continue to have to look at funding to allow us to step into that. But as I think as I shared with you already, Perry, uh, got a couple members of the community that are asking about mountain biking and when we're going to get mountain biking and the walking trails that were prioritized on that master plan. And again, so when we can find that creative funding source, we'll be moving forward. You know, the other thing that kind of in that set, in that funding horse and also the squeaky wheel is just getting some form of even visibility so we can have visibility to which um, playgrounds are going to be updated and maintained in any way. I know that we refreshed all these playgrounds, you know, 1996, a long time ago, um, and a lot of them need some love, and they're not all going to get the love at the same time. But if we could even just have... In our back pocket, like, here's the maintenance of which ones are coming next or, you know, just some, there's a light at the end of the tunnel or making sure that we're giving confidence to people that they are being make, checked to make sure they're safe and maintained. So I think it's yep. important that we continue to grow, but we really work on continuing to make sure that safety and maintenance of those playgrounds is important. And I think the last thing I'd add to that, too, is, and this is an issue in just my own work life, but for us to continue to work on telling the story about what is happening. It's not like, as a city and a community, we're dead in the water. There is a lot going on, whether it's our enterprise facilities, whether it's our park facilities, a lot of good things going on, money being spent. So 
the, the downside of that is, unfortunately, that we have a list, we have a queue of very good ideas that are just waiting to get the appropriate funding. So let's uh, make sure we don't miss the opportunity to tell the good stories about what has happened when we're looking forward at what still needs to be addressed. Anybody else have anything? Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Perry. Perry, go ahead. Council and staff updates. Um, the 2019-2020 commission appointments were just recently conducted and uh, Commissioner um, Osborne has been reappointed for another one-year term Yay. next. Uh, so we'll start in September, I believe. September will start another cycle of another one-year appointment. And then um, Zoe Lalas, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, Lalas um, will be joining us as well in September as the other uh, student representative to the Port Commission. Okay, that's it. that's it. The only thing we talked about before that will get communicated is our August meeting. I think we're still expecting to do it as an off-site. Does that still work as far as you're concerned, Perry? I think that does work. And yeah. uh, Commissioner Miller had suggested we might think about Edinburgh. We have not been back there for a few years. Uh, last time we did it... Oh, no, sorry, not Edinburgh. Um, Centennial Lakes. Centennial Lakes. Um, and we had last time we were there, we did an evening of some lawn games and some dinner and then had our meeting there. So I think that would be a good good idea to go back there as well. So we'll, uh, we'll act on that and get that messaging out to folks. But that would mean for your own calendars, if it's possible, try to block out a little bit of time ahead of a 7 o'clock start so we could gather for a little social activity and dinner. But we'll get those details out very soon. Okay. With that, I'd accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, Might. Oh, yeah. Bryn's got it.